and our airspeed is 400 miles an hour. Couple little facts here. I'm packing a Colt King Cobra. That's a 357 caliber firearm with a black rubber grip and a six inch barrel. Also, the co pilot is carrying a Kimber Custom. Welcome to, uh, welcome to Germany. <laughs> Razor 113 Online. Today's date is January 8th, 1130 in the morning. Take core values. I will always be smarter than the situation. Take core values two. I will always maintain professional conduct. Take core values three. I will always place safety of others before my own. Take core value four. I don't really remember them all, but I will not release any information about my mission without proper authorization. This will all make more sense when we get into more in the video, but throw the intro. <laughs> it's modern segregation. This is setting up a civil war. Burn the circus down, cause the world is full of clowns. They're all stupid and they're proud. Painted smiles on their mouths. I don't hang with bozos, homie. I can't be around you. Anyone who knows me knows my feet don't fit in clown shoes. Oh yes. You uh you like my you like my green chair? What's going on, everybody? We are in Poland. Uh can't really tell you because of OPSEC why I'm here, but I'm here for work. As you read the title, as you've seen on the thumbnail, I worked for this man right here. Commander Brown. Dale Brown, the United States' biggest meme right now. Great urban survival training. Our training system has been derived from the Detroit Threat Management Center and Vipers program in Detroit that started in 1996. We've been protecting families, communities, and corporations, keeping them alive and safe successfully. And what we're most proud of is that every wait person that came it, to us for assistance for has gotten that assistance hey their whole life. Who's that? Oh, Dale's face. I'm sorry, Dale. <laughs> Who's that handsome guy right there with the big ass arms? There's me. And then the other guy that kind of looks like me, the skinnier version, that's Damien. But yeah, that's uh, that's your boy. As soon as I seen Brandon Herrera throw in his hat in the ring uh, to take a piss at Dale, I figured I might as well uh, throw my hat in the ring as well. Um, this video might surprise you. So I used to work for Dale. Commander Brown. For about over a year back in 2014 2015 and I'm gonna share my experiences with you now this video might be extremely long so I apologize in advance but there's a lot of things that I want to go um, into detail about one how I got wrapped up in them like how I started working for them uh, Two, the kind of missions that we worked on or the details that we worked on uh, the, and then three the biggest one is the tactics you know people always make videos on this man's tactics will get you killed. And I actually did those tactics and I actually used some of the tactics in a real world situation. And we'll go into more detail on that. And four, why I quit, why I no longer work for the man and why I'm off working for the United States government. So yeah, I, I wanted to throw my hat in the ring because I feel like all these guys are, are taking the piss out of- To take the piss out of someone or something. This means to mock, to tease, or to make fun of in order to be funny. Dale, and it's easy to poke fun of them, but they don't know him. They just watch 30 second to 60 second little, you know, TikTok videos or whatever video he posts, little shorts that he posts online uh, on YouTube. And I feel like I work for the man. Uh, I work for a very different man. <laughs> the man that you see uh, on TikTok and YouTube now uh, is not the man that I used to work for. So he's a lot more nicer. And we'll get into that later on in the video. So uh, let's go get something to eat. I'm fucking starving. It is 11:30, and uh, we'll talk about what it was like working for the man. Let's go. Let's talk about how I found Dale. Um, I found him on a ad on Indeed.com. He was hiring for security. Uh, I applied for it. Um, they called me, I think, the next day. Now, where I interviewed was his old building, his old big old blacked out building off of Jefferson in Detroit. Um, not the building that he's at anymore, but uh, they did the interview. I see my background. My background's in weapons uh, and martial arts. I did martial arts right now. Fuck. 
almost 17 years now. So he said, yeah, you got the job. When can you start? I said ASAP. So but one of his stipulations were you had to shave completely. You can have a mustache, uh, but other than that, you, you, you had to shave every single day. No profiles, no nothing like that. So that was kind of like a weird thing for me. You have to look professional, and I guess professional to him is super clean cut. You can have the mustache, which is why he rocks the mustache all the time. Okay, back in the room. Um, it started to rain slash snow outside, so I figured it'd be easier if I just did it inside the room. Let me just fucking put this fucking hair up. Okay, so he gives me a start date, and he, he gives me a location. Uh, the location is in this dirt lot with just a shack and a beautiful, I think it was a Belgian uh, Rottweiler. Super cool dog, but it was in this tiny little shack, and he said, report here at this time. So I did. Uh, he gave me my gear, um, which is not really the gear that you guys see. I'm not wearing the, the shoulder pads or the, the motorcycle helmet. It's just like some tactical pants, uh, a shirt, and a vest um, with the logo on it. And uh, I'm assigned a, uh, a supervisor uh, or a, a lead or whatever you want to call it. And he goes over what we have to do. So I basically do like a ride along with him. Start off with before and after uh, every um, eight hour shift or however long your shift is, you have to say your decor values. Uh, Point two one Cobra Online, the uh, 31st of October 2013, approximately 9.40 a.m. There's no breathalyzer in Scanner 2. For decor value, always be smart of my situation. Decor value 1, always maintain professional conduct. 2, always play safe with others for my own. 3, I'll never allow anyone to be harmed by my action or inaction. 4, I'll be in compliance all laws, thus prevents protection of life. 5, Viper's image protects intensity, discipline, and strength. 6, Viper's manner is a humble, respectful, and professional. 7, if Viper lives by models, loyalty is valid, discipline, and strength, so I protect my life. 8, I'll quickly and correctly complete all directions that not violate my SOP. 9, I'll not deviate from my last authorized directive issued. 10, I'll not release any information about my training or without proper authorization. I want to say it was like one to 10 and you had to say them all uh, without skipping a beat and you had to do it all in one minute. Can't say um, can't say any of that. You have to look directly into the camera. Um, and by the way, the, the Razor 113, uh, that's like your code names. So he's Commander Brown. Commander Brown. But uh, Edward has a rank. So you start off at like nothing and then you work your way up to, I think it's like Sergeant's the first one and then you get Captain, things like that. Anyway, so yeah, you say your deck of core values and you got to do it all with, within a minute. That was pretty, that was the fun part. <laughs> you had to learn these things. You had to say it within one minute. You had to send it to them. Everything we have is on an iPad. Uh, so you're given a company phone and an iPad uh, with a bunch of programs on it. And everything's timestamped. Everything's video recorded um, and photo taken. It has a timestamp in the bottom right hand corner. Um, and you have to send it up to the cloud. Um, which is where Dale tracks everything that you do. He was here. See this picture? This gives the date and time he was here. This shows where he's going. This is his route. That's his name. This explains where he's going. This is F1, his trajectory is step, another facility. We know it's him because his picture. It's what time he's, he's, he's leaving. This is how many hours he worked today. This is how fast his vehicle is driving. This is the total distance he traveled today. This is max speed of his vehicle today. If you're assigned a vehicle, uh, you have to do a uh, pre-vehicle inspection. So you walk around the vehicle, you know, talk about the inventory, what was in it, what's not in it, what's missing. That way the last person that had that vehicle is responsible for that stuff, which is very, very smart. Um, you log your gas. Everything's GPS tracked. You go look at Google Maps. If you have a mission, everything's tracked. Whether it be you go to step, uh, your trajectory, where you're going next, things of that nature. So I'm not going to talk too much uh, in detail about his contracts. I don't know how um, I don't know how detailed I can go, but I'll just give a brief thing. Um, so the details, the details that he'd go or he'd have. All of us go on. Um, everybody varies. Everyone has a different skill set based upon on how your looks, your background, your experience, um, things that you can handle that he thinks that you can handle. Some people do something as simple as sitting in front of a schoolyard first thing in the morning when uh, kids are going to school, 10, 15 minutes, wait for all the kids to go in, you leave, go to your next mission. You can go to uh, a grocery store. You can sit in front of a grocery store, sit inside a grocery store, make sure that nobody gets robbed or those senior citizens get robbed, things of that nature. You can escort people to and from the airport. Now, I've done this personally. Um, 
a couple of doctors, a couple of surgeons, a high-end clientele, I would go to their house, I would pick them up, I would drive them to the airport, and that would be it. Um, sometimes I'd drive to the airport, pick them up, take them back to their house, make sure their house is secure, and then I'd leave. You go there, you make sure everything's copacetic, and then you go on and go on with your day. Now his biggest, and probably his, his biggest contract that he has, that he still goes on to this day, is the Detroit Golf, uh, golf Course and uh, Sherwood Forest. Now that's that place I've done I've done security there here and there. Um, we just drive through. Uh, if you get any reports of break-ins, you get called. You go over there, go check it out, videotape everything. It's actually it's pretty decent. But he's had that contract for years. Don't get it twisted. Dale Brown is a millionaire. Dale Brown, an ex-army paratrooper, began teaching his own brand of self-defense in the early '90s. He started his own security company in 2000. So this is a Detroit fair fight. Four on one. Keep your knees bent. Brown says his 60-person okay. Viper force has more than 5,000 private citizens as clients, along with 100 businesses. Altogether, the company brings in about $2 million a year. <laughs> this guy's been making millions and millions since before I was working for him. So he's at the peak of his career now. I mean, he's got Coleon Noir talking about him. He's got, he's all over the news. He's he's on he's at Ford Field. Like the guy, the the guy's popularity is higher than it's ever been. So more workers, right? More employees means more clientele, which means more contracts. So he's probably head, hand over hand making fucking millions of dollars right now. So let's talk about the sketchier details that he's had me on. Uh, I have delivered PPOs, personal protection orders, to people. Um, I have escorted people to and from uh, court. I have escorted people to and from their house when they have like a domestic violence or gang related incident. Sometimes people would snitch on somebody and they want protection so they hire us uh, to, to the point where, or other instances would be Somebody feared for their life, uh, like a significant other or an ex-boyfriend, even an ex-girlfriend or an ex-employee threatens their life, we would go there and protect. Now, one mission in particular, and I'm going to kind of use this to traverse into what Dale is like as a boss. Now, at the time, I couldn't stand him, right? Working for him, being, being a younger guy, I couldn't stand him. But now that I'm older, I respect him as a shrewd mogul businessman this guy is a this 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 guy's you guys don't understand like the guy that you see is a meme that you think is a meme he's not really a meme like this is his life he's been doing it like this for years this man dale brown does not sleep there's people that call off work last minute or just call no call no shows period and dale brown has to go to that contract and do the job himself this man does not sleep the cars that we had it was a Chevy Volt, all blacked out Chevy Volt with the silver badges, had the little white strobe on the top, uh, but he had cameras installed. So he had cameras in the front, not pointing towards the cars, pointing towards the driver, and then cameras in the rear pointing towards the back of our head. So when you're driving these cars, it shows your speed, it shows GPS, it shows everything. But mainly what he had it for was for the night shift guys, if you would be sleeping, he would catch you sleeping, he would take a screenshot of that or take a recording of it and catch you sleeping and use it against you. Um, so he'd die either dock your pay or he'll punish you in some way that Dale Brown tactically does. And I couldn't stand it, but from a businessman standpoint, I completely understand it now. So this man, Dale, does not sleep. You have people that are call off jobs. They get a call from the business owner or somebody that somebody's not here, blah, blah, blah. And he has to leave. He used to live downtown Detroit. I don't know where he lives now. He used to live in these really nice high rises in Detroit. So he would have to get up out of his bed suit up and go do this contract itself and not a lot of can can you say that you would do the same thing honestly the the guy the guy lives this life this guy is about that life which is why he has my utmost respect so fast forward i was doing a detail on a millionaire guy he owns i don't know what kind of business he was in but um he owns a company and one of his secretaries had some dirt on him uh, I don't really want to get into detail about it. But anyway, she threatened his life. He fired her. She threatened his life. He feared for his life. So he called us or called Dale. Dale gave me uh, the detail because I was one of his higher experience guys when it comes to um, 
criminal, military violence, tactics, and things of that nature. So I could handle myself pretty well. It was me and Derek were his top two guys. Uh, Derek was like 6'6", big old black dude, looked like uh, Slim Thug. <laughs> um, but anyways, we got the call and he put me on the detail. He says, you gotta protect this guy, this guy's life is in danger, blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool, he said, shadow him. Don't let him go anywhere by himself. Okay, no problem, sir, we'll do. So I met the gentleman, walked around his establishment, he showed me around the perimeter. Uh, he told me a few stories about this young lady. So long story short, fast forward a little bit. He's outside mowing his lawn. He's like, I'm gonna mow my lawn and we're at his uh, business. I wanna mow my lawn. I said, okay, no problem, sir. So I'm standing outside. I got the car parked in the grass, semi in the grass and he's mowing his lawn. He stops and asks me if I can go get him something to drink in the fridge, in the break room. Okay, no problem, sir. So in order to go through um, his establishment, you have to go through uh, the waiting room slash lobby. And the lobby is cut off by a door, which is locked. So it's like, you know, little the glass doors that you go into a waiting room um, and then they open up a door to let you in. It's like that. So I walk through that. I open, unlock the door because I have the keys. Go through, go to the break room. Um, I grab him a Gatorade and I grab me a water. And I hear the door open because when you open up the door, bing, bing. So a little siren. I'm like, what the hell? So I look on the, the camera and this, I see Dale Brown sitting in the coat closet through the camera i'm looking at him and he's sitting there like this so there's a walkway that leads up to the door just like this but there's a coat closet and he's sitting there like this i can clearly see this man just sitting there in the dark like, okay so i open up the door i'm like dale what's up he's like why aren't you outside with the, with the client and i have a gatorade and a water i was literally gone for five seconds so this is where me and Dale got into our first uh, verbal altercation. Now, w what I will say after knowing what I know is Dale, obviously coming from a military background, he will break you and rebuild you. He has to get all this laziness out of your system to mold you uh, to be a part of that life, to indoctrinate you to be somebody like him. If that makes sense, but in a good way, because it's his business. This is what he does. So, why aren't you out there with the client? And doing the eyebrow thing, why aren't you out there with the client? But it was in a very vulgar, meaning tone. And Dale Brown's 5'6", I'm 6'2". I just laugh, I'm like, what are you talking, like I'm grabbing him some, some water and I heard the bell go off, so I seen you in the closet, why are you in the closet? That could have been somebody to hurt our client, blah, blah, blah. This is not what you do. He started like yelling at me. So I started yelling back at him. We were, oh, well, he's a little bit shorter, but we were damn near nose to nose screaming at each other. And I told him he's got the wrong fucking idea, blah, blah, blah. So after that, that was my first like altercation with Dale Brown. And at, at the time, I'm like, this motherfucker has a lot of nerve. Like I was in and out. I went to go grab the, I clearly have a water and a Gatorade. And, uh, but yeah, other than that, we, we, we squashed it. I told him I apologize. Uh, it was a misunderstanding. I didn't mean to yell at you. That's the kind of person that I am. I don't, I don't combat loudness with loudness. It's just not what I do. Like, it's just two wrongs don't make a right. So I apologize as a man. I said, listen, I apologize. I'm sorry for yelling. I get why you're upset, but you, it's misunderstanding. It's a misunderstanding. So that was the first little altercation I had with Dale Brown. That was it. That was the only one period. Now there's other, uh, other stories that I won't get into of other employees that have him on recording just straight cussing their ass out like somebody from the hood. Fuck you, motherfucker, come here and do that shit. I'll beat your motherfucking ass. Like, holy shit. Dale Brown is about it. But Dale Brown can always put on different personas because that's Dale Brown, that's what he does. Now, another job that, that he had us on was, we call it the shitbird job. It was for shammers. <laughs> uh, this job, this detail, was horrible. I hated it. I did it one time. And the reason why I only did it one time is because somebody called off, not for good reason, but I see why, because when I tell you, it's kind of shitty. This job was a night shift job from sundown to sunup uh, in the middle of Detroit at a junkyard. Doesn't sound that bad until I tell you the details. So uh, this was in the slums of Detroit at a junkyard that's got broken into numerous times we didn't have a shack. There was no guard shack. There was no none of that. There was a broken down Crown Vic parked in front, uh, in front of the, the locked gate that hasn't moved in years. 
Uh, and the only way to get heat was to start the car and to run the car. You had a gas can in the back and it had an exhaust leak. So it's just, it, it was shitty. So you had to start the car because there was all your dongles and shit to charge your iPad and your company phone and the flashlight that you're given, which is the big, thick ass flashlight. And uh, it was an exhaust leak. So you couldn't really stay in there long because it smelled like gas from the gas can in the back uh, and the exhaust leak from the exhaust. But you didn't stay in there long anyways just because you had to do a perimeter check and you had a, um, a little fob that you touch at specific locations around the compound. Um, sometimes the, the, the hubs were out, so you had to physically take a photo of every single one. But anyways, it, my, I had to do this detail in the middle of winter, downtown somewhere, somewhere in the slums of Detroit. And uh, I felt bad for some of the guys that were put on this detail because a lot of guys that worked for Dale Brown didn't have their CPL or their CCW. They didn't have their concealed carry. Uh, and what Dale gave them was a paintball gun. Yeah. So to, if your life was ever in danger, if someone were to hop that fence, see you uh, and want to take you out and get what they came for, all you have the means to protect yourself was a paintball gun at that time. Kind of shitty, but I have my CPL, so I really didn't care. I didn't carry the paintball gun, but yeah. So you go around, you touch these little things and you go back into your thing, you do your report, type it on your iPad and that's it. So by the time you do your, it takes about an hour to do the whole thing and you do, 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 do do your reports and that's it. You do it from until the business opens up. I think it's like six or seven in the morning. So they close at eight, you get there at 8.30 and you do your report or you do your, your detail until six, seven o'clock in the morning. That was a shitty detail. My main detail though, what I did was I guarded cigarette trucks. Now there's a business right down the street from that that supplied every single, it felt like almost every single store. It felt like every single store uh, in Detroit, every liquor store, gas station, um, little mom and pop shop with cigarettes. They, they did a lot more, but I was just on the cigarette truck. Now, you guys don't know anything about cigarettes. It's a very lucrative business. A box, uh, just a regular box of a couple cartons of Newports is $10,000 a box. And I'm in a box truck that's full of cigarettes. And I wanna say it was a cash business. I seen cash in and out every day. They never uh, barely wrote a check, it was all cash. So what we do is we go to the little bodegas, gas stations in the hoods of Detroit. I'd get out with the guys. Uh, they go unload the truck. I sit outside, make sure they, you know, unload the truck. I walk in, escort them inside, come in out, do the same thing um, every day to make sure that they did not get robbed. Now the gear that I had was I had my tactical vest. I had little pants, but I had a, uh, a thigh serpa holster with my um, Beretta chambered in 40. And then on my chest piece, I had a chest holster with my Desert Eagle chambered in 50 AE. It's overkill, but I just do it to do it. Um, we didn't have bulletproof vests. He just gave us tactical vests. So if anything were to go down, I would pray to God I didn't get shot. But I had the means to protect myself with both my pistols. Uh, also, he gave us a, um, a little pistol uh, mace gun too. Uh, pepper pistol. This pepper pistol shoots a stream. It has a light, strobing and straight light. Uh, it's a steady light. So there's that. So I would do that. God forbid we never got robbed. I've had encounters with people that would strike up conversations to try to look in the truck as they're talking to me. And I would persuade them the other way. Um, if they're talking to me, back of the truck's right here, I'd persuade them the other way on the other side of the truck while they're looking at the store behind me. Uh, but other than that, um, one truck did get robbed, uh, but it wasn't me. Yeah, we were on seven mile. The truck that got robbed was on eight mile. And that was pretty much it. Um, I strike up conversations with people. They say I look like a fucking G.I. Joe, which is whatever, as long as I'm making them laugh and distracting them from the hundreds of thousands of dollars getting shoveled in uh, with cigarettes into these stores. But that was the main detail that I got hired on for. Now, the cooler details that I got on was I, was, I did uh, bodyguarding for a couple celebrities that flew into town, like Ello Black uh, did a music video in downtown Detroit, this abandoned, um, this abandoned church downtown. That was pretty cool. Uh, one of my favorites though is Judy Greer was coming in to do a photo shoot uh, in Corktown uh, for uh, Good Housekeeping Magazine. And I met her and the crew, Gloria, the lady that was doing the photo shoot. Super cool fucking people. They actually let me be into the shoot uh, because throughout the day we started getting to know each other and I made them laugh a bunch of times. They made me laugh, they got super comfortable. They asked me if I wanted to be in the shoot and uh, yeah, there's your, there's your boy. <laughs> 
good old young Ron. And yeah, that was that was super cool. So there was always good times with certain details. You know, you always had to maintain professionalism, but it's a lot easier for me to get to know somebody without being too, too serious. Yes, I'm there to protect you, don't get me wrong. Uh, my presence is there and I do look um, very threatening, but I'm a person just like you. So I'm gonna talk to you, I'm, I'm gonna talk, get to know you a little bit, not just be this, this statue that's sitting there, you know, that's just not me. Uh, I've done details for a lot of people before overseas in Afghanistan and even in a war zone, I was still comfortable enough to just talk to people because it takes people's mind off certain things also. All right, so those are the jobs that I did. Those are just a brief example of some of the jobs that I did. Now let's talk about the tactics. The videos that everybody seems to poke fun of, make fun of, that's all over YouTube. So the, the tactics. Uh, I was part of, obviously, Dust, Detroit Urban Survival Training, Threat Management, CSG, and Vipers. I was a part of all that. I was, part, I was his, one of his main, bigger guys. I was somebody who was more intimidating looking than most, most of the people there, and me and Derek. So he took us and did the Vipers training. That's more of a vulgar style training um, where you pretty much uh, demobilize your threat instead of, uh, you know, Dale always preaches three moves or less. It's, I don't know why he hasn't said that in his video. It's always three moves or less, and that's basically it. His style is called the Eclecticon style, which is a configuration of all the martial arts that he's, uh, he's learned over the years, apparently. But yeah, so he's, he's taught us his hand-to-hand -hand combat stuff that he teaches everybody on TikTok and YouTube. And I will tell you that personally, I have used, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, and I've done this. I've done all of these uh, in real world situations. I would bounce uh, on the weekends at some clubs like Mexican Town. And I use these tactics almost every single night to get people either off somebody or off me when it was closing time. And they didn't like that they paid $60 for a 24 pack of Modelo. And it was closing time and I'm trying to tell them that, hey, you can't take that with you. They didn't like that. And so stuff got physical a lot. And I use the tactics. Now, <laughs> when it comes down to the, the firearms disarms. Yes. Uh, the weapons disarms, I have never used them. So I can't can't confirm that but the training that we did uh in his crazy looking warehouse was was interesting it was very very interesting there was a giant tower that sways and, and moves side to side and you had to climb up with all your gear on climb down it there was a pole that was in the middle that you had to walk across um climb up a rope jump over like up top uh, jump over like a little wall get down, walk across a beam, shimmy down with, uh, with a rope. And then he had the, um, the four punching bags, uh, the fair fight, the Detroit fair fighting. So he would push uh, all four of these bags on you and you would have to hit, jab, block, get out of that situation, all four of them. Uh, you have to do that for one minute. So that was pretty exhausting. Uh, the hand-to-hand -hand combat with the guys was pretty fun. Um, the weapons disarms, it is what it is. I know biomechanics. Uh, I know how weapons work because that's my background. So yes, um, when you take a you know a slide and put it out of battery for quite uh, you know for a second, um, yes that does work. But in a real world situation, when you do go to grab for someone's gun, yes they're going to pull back um, and they're going to fire. So. <laughs> so if they try to back up, wait. Yes, three moves or less is nice when it comes to disarming things, um, but it doesn't stop. In a real world situation, there's no such thing as three moves or less. If somebody were to have a knife just like this, um, you're not disarming this knife, um, but you try to grab this knife out of my hand and I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut the fuck out of you. So there's certain situations, yes, they're good for videos and they're good for beginners, but when it comes down to people that actually have done this stuff, um, that have been trained, like I was trained by Blackwater, back in 2011, uh, 2012. So I have a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat skills when it comes to that out in Moyoc, North Carolina. So I knew some of the tactics he was talking about and I would straight up tell him like, it doesn't work. Um, but hey, the guy's millionaire, I'm not, it is what it is. But you know, it, it's good to watch, it's entertaining, it, it's fun. When it comes down to his tactics, some do work and some don't, but it's just entertaining. Now I respect Dale, there's some things that he has said 
that I do not stand by. I don't support him on everything he said. Dumpty people know. So this is not for you. This is for you to defend against a criminal, a violent criminal. How about if Chris Kyle had been in my training, he would have read the body language of that guy standing behind him. He would have never let that guy stand behind him with a loaded gun, ever. Uh, five minutes with Chris Kyle, he would have been like, oh, whoa, yeah. No, I'm not going to have somebody behind me <laughs> and uh, with a gun. This is not going to happen. I, I wouldn't have said that, Dale, especially to, to Coleon Noir. Come on now. Chris Kyle, come on now. You just... SEAL Team compared to Dale Brown, not the best look. But yeah, so when it comes down to it, I respect the man. I don't respect a few things that he has said, but uh, I love to see growth. You know, he went from that seedy black building in Detroit that he was there for years uh, to a really nice place in Ferndale. So Ferndale Urban Survival Training, maybe? I don't, I don't know. But yeah, it's I love it. Dale, I... I I appreciate you. We have to get together sometime uh, when I come back from Europe and do a video. We're supposed to do a video a while back, um, but during the circumstances of my father passing, me growing up in Michigan, um, my father passing, I really didn't have time to go over there and check out his new facility. Um, I would love to do a video with him just to sit down and talk. And so um, the reason why I quit, now the reason why I quit was uh, one day called me into his office and he says, hey, Razor, I don't want you to carry a gun anymore. What? And I told him, uh, I said, excuse me, you had me doing security detail uh, guarding cigarette trucks in, in the slums of Detroit. He's like, I want you to carry this non-gun. And what a non-gun is, is like a movie prop gun. There are several different type of weapons we use in the film business. We use conventional blank for conventional blank firing. On a revolver, you don't have to do anything to it. You just use a real gun, put your blanks in and fire it. And it's the same for rifles and shotguns. But for semi-automatics and fully automatics, it's a different story. The guns have to be adapted before they'll fire properly. So the barrel's threaded and then a plug is screwed in so that it'll hold gas in the chamber and cycle the next round. RIP Alec Baldwin. It's a movie prop gun and it, and it shoots blanks. Sounds like a real gun. And I'm like, Dale, I'm not gonna do this. And so like with Dale's rebuttal to people that always carry guns are, well, uh, you might as well carry a fire, fire extinguisher with you at all times because you're more likely to put out a fire than get in a firefight. Or I might as well just have you wear a helmet uh, all the time because you're more likely to get in a car accident than you are to get into a firefight. Are you stupid or something? I'm just like, it doesn't work like that, Dale. I'm not comfortable with that. I refuse. I'm always gonna carry my guns. I'm gonna carry both my guns on me. Um, and there's nothing that you could do about it. And uh, that was it. That was the, the last straw for me. Uh, my son was being born at the time. So I talked to Dale and his wife, um, Mantis114, I believe, uh, Lieutenant Commander. I talked to both of them and I said, hey, uh, I have my baby shower coming up. I would like to go to my baby shower. I need to request this day off. And I'll never forget this to the day I die. Dale looked at me and started laughing. He's like, what kind of guy goes to his baby shower? <laughs> Are you serious? I said, I said, me, Dale, this is my first child. And he's like, what, do, do, men, go to, uh, do men go to bachelorette parties too? I said, some do, some do, Dale. I, but I'm gonna go to, it's a family event. It's not like a formal thing where it's just all girls. It's a baby shower. I'm gonna be there, open up presents and thank everybody. He just started laughing, but he gave me the time off. But yeah, after that whole, the whole situation with, uh, you have to start carrying a non-gun was the nail in the coffin for me. I'm not going to protect um, cigarettes for a client if I cannot protect them or myself. You have it in your deck of core values. I will always place the safety of others before my own. And I cannot protect or bring anybody safety if I'm not carrying a real gun uh, to protect their lives over my own. So after that, I had to uh, throw my hat or throw the towel into the ring and give up. Um, so I quit. And that's the story of, uh, of me working for Dale Brown. Um, no malice. And this is all my experience. Um, I'm not here to take a piss on him. He's a great dude. 
he was just more of a serious business mogul when I worked for him, opposed to the TikTok variant you guys see now where he's collaborating and laughing and cutting up. Master Ken. I always called, dude, from the fucking first time I worked for him, like, this is back in 2014, 2015. This dude is a fucking black Master Ken. He doesn't even know. And sure as shit, he goes and fucking does a collaboration with Master Ken. I love it. Uh, like I said, I love growth. Uh, I love to see him prevail, especially for his daughter. If you guys don't know, he does have a daughter. Super cute little girl. And yeah, it's it, it's cool to see growth, man. But I had to throw my hat in the ring on this video. Everyone's shitting on him. You guys don't even fucking know the half of it. I hate that people are just taking a piss out of this man. And uh, I had to put my two cents in. So I feel like I'm the only one to make a video that actually worked for this man, that respects him. Um, for the, the father, the businessman, uh, and the friend that he is. He's always had good things to say about me, and uh, he's always treated me right when it comes to being a person. So, uh, Dale, I appreciate you. I wish you nothing but the best for you and your family and your business. Um, this is Ron. I'll see you guys in the next one. I'm out. It's modern segregation. This is setting up a civil war. Burn the circus down, because the world is full of clowns. They're all stupid and they're proud. Smiles on they mouths I don't hang with bozos, homie I can't be around you Anyone who knows me knows my feet don't fit in clown shoes